Aaron seems to be off camera for a second. Oh, there he is. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready whenever you are, Richard. So. Okay. Yeah. Go. Go ahead, Aaron. Great. So. Uh, I'm excited to introduce uh, Rashmi Jha from the University of Cincinnati, um, my actually my alma mater, uh, and uh, just south here of uh, of their Dayton office. Um, there's a number of folks that are on the call today, or on this on this um, meeting as well, that represent various students from uh, Rashmi's lab and uh, the other labs at the University of Cincinnati. And um, you know, a lot of these folks are potential Galwegians. Um, but also folks that are also uh, interested in the same things that we care about. And when we look at um, Rashmi's work, it, it tends to kind of link to, to two things. One is the area of the hardware world that uh, uh, our, our uh, hardware team has, has spent a lot of time looking at. And the other aspect is um, how we can use verification uh, in, in co-design or verification of hardware. Uh, as we look at new tools that can be created and new techniques that can be utilized to create uh, secure chips, uh, as well as evaluating some of the potential software that goes in these spaces. So uh, in that vein, um, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Rashmi and uh, let her give the talk. And uh, hopefully as she's dealing with the same things that we all deal with, she's got a couple of kids at home. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, as we, as we do these remote talks, um, you know, it's, it's great to just keep in mind um, that we have uh, you know, our, our families and everything else that are a part of this and, and Rashmi is no different. And so I'll turn it over to her and we'll go from there. Great. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for getting me connected to your team and giving me a chance to present. Um, I've also invited a few of my students here um, who would uh, want to know more about uh, the company as well as if there is something they want to add while I'm presenting, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, so uh, today's talk, uh, I'm going to tailor my talk um, towards on-chip AI, hardware security and trust using advanced process nodes. So uh, let me see, yes. So in today's talk, I'm going to start with the outline. My background from my PhD, as well as my work experience at my IBM Microelectronic uh, Electronics, um, uh, lies in the areas of the development of semiconductor devices and process technology. So, in, uh, I completed my PhD in 2006 at North Carolina State University, and I worked on high K metal gates. So, in 2006-2007, uh, for the 45 nanometer node, high K was introduced uh, along with the metal gates. And since then, it has been the backbone of uh, all types of scaling that is going in semiconductor uh, industry, even today. So I worked on um, high K metal gates for 45 nanometer, 32 nanometer at IBM Microelectronics, and uh, then moved to academia. And uh, at that point, um, member store technology was taking up because, uh, you know, Moore's law was, I mean, it has been uh, claimed to be achieving the ending since long, but people always figure out ways to keep pushing it. But at the same time, it had become very apparent that new types of device technologies will be needed to accelerate or to achieve the performance that people are looking into. So we got into this area of memory to devices because it was CMOS compatible and we were looking for something which is CMOS compatible. So then we started doing a lot of research on semiconductor devices, particularly memoristive technologies, and developed a lot of um, insight into how the device itself works. But then just knowing uh, devices was not enough, we wanted to make use of devices. And then we got into this area of developing integrated chips using um, memoristive technology along with some advanced semiconductor process. And these days, as you know, for in-memory computing, uh, RM technology is becoming uh, important, um, so that's how everything got aligned. And then, um, towards last few years, we started to look into hardware security and trust. 
because of the lack of trusted microelectronics foundries in the United States, there is a big push, as everybody knows, to really ensure that the microelectronics that we design is stolen, the IPs are not stolen, and the components that we receive or the chips and the dice that we receive from overseas is not tampered. <clears throat> so how can we design new types of uh, process monitoring structures, things like that? So <clears throat> we started looking into that, got started by working in collaboration with Air Force Research Lab uh, through a DAGSI uh, to my student, Thomas Schulz, who is now working at Micron. And since then, the area has evolved. And so uh, we have started to invest more interest into it. Um, and there is a lot of opportunities. So I'm going to start my talk with uh, discussing trends in semiconductor process technology, because this is, this is really uh, magnificent, as you will see. And then opportunities and challenges. Nothing comes for free. Every time there is an opportunity, there is a challenge. So what is the new challenge with the semiconductor process technology? And then uh, we will talk about how this, the new advancement in the process technology is appropriate for developing AI chip, which as you all know, is pretty hot. And um, uh, Galwa has a team that is looking into actually low power AI chip development. So I was very excited about it. And then um, uh, uh, details into no uh, a little bit into novel approaches for hardware security and trust. Over the last few years, a lot of people have produced a lot of work in this area. So the question is, are the problems solved or if there is some more scope for research and how can we contribute in that uh, arena? And then uh, resiliency, as you will see, connecting it back to the semiconductor process technology, you will see that resiliency in the system is becoming extremely important because devices that are to the picture um, have some uh, reliability of those devices are not very really well understood yet. So resiliency is becoming critical. And finally, we'll get to the conclusions. So with that, uh, I wanted to introduce a little bit about my research efforts and my research group. So we go, uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we uh, go into the entire spectrum of, let's say, um, uh, semiconductor based um, processor development all the way from um, uh, components, uh, electronic materials to the uh, architectures. And then we also work in the areas of developing the application, taking the well-defined SOCs, um, such as Jetson Nano or GPUs. We can develop uh, uh, data analytic techniques for um, monitoring uh, health. Particularly, I would like to highlight a project we have with NIOSH, where we are looking into the data collected by NIOSH using a wearable devices to predict um, the risk for back pain for workers who are working in various types of uh, industrial environment. So, um, so we have some efforts going on in the area of developing the um, applications of AI, but majority of our uh, effort is towards uh, systems uh, all the way from materials to the uh, to devices to certain components to architectures and the systems. So um, in terms of devices, which is my core expertise, um, uh, we are experts in CMOS, all types of CMOS devices. We can um, design uh, uh, circuits around it, test all types of CMOS devices, process control monitors, flash memory is something that we have not worked too much, but uh, simply because we did not need to, uh, but we know the technology very well. Uh, various types of emerging non-volatile memory technology, one-time programmable memory, which is becoming very important these days, particularly for uh, reconfigurable electronics and storing the accumulation, things like that. New types of device technologies such as resistive RAM, memristor, electric transistors, internal transistors, various types of sensors, and then we can uh, provide solutions for additive, monolithic, and 3D integration, as well as the real testing of the reliability of these integrated dyes. Towards the circuit, since we know all these components very well, uh, we are not restricting ourselves to the development of circuitry using just the standard component that is offered by the foundries. 
uh, though that serves the foundation uh, in our circuit design topographies, we also try to include uh, new types of devices and try to see if we incorporate these new types of devices, then how can the circuits benefit by the integration of these devices? And with that, uh, if there is real advantage, uh, I'm sure the foundries will start um, introducing those devices in their line. Or uh, there could be some trusted foundry inside the United States itself that can provide these type of speciality devices. Towards the architecture, we take we model the circuit components, we develop a higher level model, and then we can simulate the architectures to see uh, whether the uh, uh, functionality of these architectures is uh, fulfilled or not. And then at systems level, we have not done too much of testing or integration. And that's where I'm seeking um, collaboration with Galwa, where we can work in some type of collaborative environment. We can develop uh, these speciality chips, uh, integrate it with the systems and see if it is benefiting the systems in any way. One of the other uh, interests for us lies in being able to um, design these circuits in collaboration so we get access to the state-of-the-art uh, transistor technology. As you know, 22 nanometer and below nodes are becoming very competitive and expensive. Uh, most of the universities don't have opportunity to tape it out uh, in their own uh, research budget. So if we can collaborate with industry, it will be uh, very official for both of us where uh, me and my students can work towards designing this circuit with a 22 nanometer, 14 nanometer, and other transistor technology node. And then uh, we can work together to tape out this circuit through whichever channel uh, you guys are working on doing that. So that would be like a project which will mutually benefit all of us. And in the process, we will all create workforce because students need to know how these um, transistor nodes are working, what are their reliability issues, how to test them, how to verify them. So they are ready to join the workforce and then you know address all the challenges that come along with it. So this is how our research area is spanned. Um, in terms of security, we are not only working at the circuits and device world to provide the resiliency in the uh, our solutions for hardware primitives, security primitives, but we are also working at the application level where we make use of um, um, the uh, well-defined SOCs to either train it or to do some more way of modeling the cybersecurity approaches and then integrating it with the system um, to get to make a resilient system. In terms of students, here is the list of students and various projects. I'm not going to go into um, uh, the names of all students, but um, mostly you can see there are students who are work, working in neuromorphic or AI chip design, hardware security, cyber security, and then um, um, AI in wearables. And uh, we have a small effort going on in the areas of uh, sensor development. Particularly, I'm very interested in uh, developing sensors that can sense the neurotransmitters in the brain. And by sensing the neurotransmitters in the brain, you can do two things. First of all, you can um, really predict a lot of diseases, um, neurological diseases. And second, um, you can make use of these sensors to interface with your artificial AI chips. So you establish a way communication. So uh, that's how our uh, research group is spanned. In terms of agencies, uh, majority of our research funded by National Science Foundation. So I would really like to thank National Science Foundation for funding our research. And then we have a lot of collaborative funded research projects with um, AFRL and then uh, DAXI. DAXI is something that is, uh, I think, uh, the state of Ohio's uh, effort to um, match the students and the professors uh, in Ohio universities with, uh, uh, with their mentors at uh, AFRL. And I particularly think this is a great opportunity for us to really work in collaboration with AFRL to know what are the challenges they are facing and how we can provide solutions uh, and in the process of training the students. Um, and then uh, some of the small business companies in this area, Adaptive TDKC, the design knowledge company, uh, and, uh, and the federal agency NIOSH, which works, uh, which is a part of actually CDC. And uh, it uh, deals with um, the occupational uh, safety in various types of workplace environment. So with that, um, uh, do you guys have any questions? 
or do you want to keep the questions till the end? Whatever your preference is, Rashmi. Okay, great. So with that, I will move on to the, um, to going on, um, we're continuing with my uh, talk. So trends in semiconductor. Um, so this is a famous slide from International Roadmap for Devices and Systems, IRDS. Uh, so you would have heard all these terminologies which are very famous, like one of them is more, more. So more, more is how can you continue scaling the CMOS devices? And this chart shows us the roadmap till 22, but 14, 7, 5, 3, all of them are there in the pipeline. So I'm going to show uh, some of them. And in the this whole of more than more, some of the emerging devices such as RAM memory stores also come into the and there is this another uh, terminologies which is called more than more. So more than more is how can you in uh, how can you uh, integrate more functionality to the same chip? So instead of logic device doing its logic work, how can it also incorporate sensors or passive type of RF communication uh, and integration for uh, harvesting energy and things like that? So these two. Uh, now, these two approaches have become very important in the semiconductor industry um, in terms of um, uh, how they look at it is more, more, and then beyond more devices, and then more than more is, uh, is achieved by various types of packaging technologies such as 2.5D integration, 3D integration, monolithic integration, stuff like that, and then system integration, and then uh, customized functionality. So this is how the uh, semiconductor uh, roadmap is moving in terms of developing process technology. And this gives you a table from that IRDS uh, uh, roadmap for the more more devices. So you can see that um, we are right now in um, uh, 2017 was FDSOI FinFETs and then 2019 FinFETs 21. Um, lateral gate all around transistors. You can, you can see that how these uh, finfets have evolved into the nanowires. Gate is wrapping around it, and then you have source and drain. And then um, in 2024, you move to three nanometer where you have lateral gate around, and lateral gate around. So this vertical gate around transistor is actually pretty fascinating in terms of the way transistors are laid. So instead of these transistors being lateral between source and drain, uh, the transistors are now becoming vertical. The channel of the transistor is now be becoming vertical, where you have source at the bottom, uh, gate as this tiny little uh, yellow um, color, and then drain on top of it. And then moving on, you have all uh, various types of fascinating options, uh, lateral gate around, now vertical gate around, and then 3D VLSI or 3D transistors are coming to the picture where you know, the transistor that itself has become 3D is getting stacked on top of each other. So everything is going to 3D and then uh, even more complicated structures. So these are some of the, um, you know, emerging uh, um, architectures of the transistor itself, which provides better performance along with opportunity to make a lot more innovative circuits simply because now the layout of the transistor has also changed. And all of this has been uh, made available because of the advancement in the lithography as well as various types of other process integration tools. Uh, you know that uh, extreme UV and things like that is now becoming mainstream and uh, people are uh, trying to uh, make more use of it. Another fascinating thing that I want you to really notice is channel material. So earlier it used to be silicon, but now they are integrating more number of fascinating materials into the silicon, into the uh, channel. For example, silicon germanium, and then you have germanium 3.5s, all these things. So all these things are basically to improve the transistor performance, but at the same time, these are new materials we have to understand, and they could have their own reliability issues, which is at this point not very well understood. And then um, this is uh, uh, this is rest of the things that you can see. Where another interesting thing you can see that memory on logic 3D devices, memory on logic heterogeneous integration, logic on logic heterogeneous integration. So a lot of these functionalities are coming into the picture, uh, which is very good for the developers. 
So uh, going a little bit in more, uh, more into more more CMOS options, um, you can see that this is just an exaggerated picture of what I just showed you. So you, you can see it visually better. But I wanted to highlight what you get all around just see that um, this is your source. This is your drain on top, and this pink over here is your um, gate, and is vertical. So by having this topographies, you can um, stack the transistors into various ways. For example, this is a parallel configuration of the transistor. And so you can see that um, uh, by having these transistors in various topographies, you can make very innovative circuits out of this architecture of the transistor itself. It's very fascinating. Compared to it, if you look at these um, layouts, there is really a scalability in the size, which is what we are all looking for when we go for the scaling. So now, uh, if you again look into international roadmap for devices and systems, uh, what are the challenges with these scale technologies? So reliability issues, increased variability. So all these devices are going to have increased variability and lack of reliability models. So to really make a reliability model, which is statistically sound, we need to collect data and a lot of data into various conditions. And that data is currently not as available. So various models for failure and reliability degradation, aging, things like that is not available for these devices. So they need to be tested. And that is where we need to work together to get access to these devices so we can test it. Uh, early failure could be, um, big issue for these type of devices and new materials that is not well known to the designers so you know uh, if you don't know the material you don't know what are the reliability issues with it so um, uh, it all boils down to getting uh, testing more devices making a robust model and then um, you cannot uh, with these variabilities and challenges um, according to this um, article uh, worst case designs will be overkill. So if you design your system for the worst case, then you will never be able to meet or it will be very difficult for you to meet the performance metrics. So you will be, you will have to be very judicious to come up with what would what be your uh, conditions. And based on that, you have to design your circuitry. So, but those extreme conditions will be, uh, will be bounded by what you think has to be some way of predictive. And because of all these limitations, resiliency at circuits and system level is very, very important now, okay? So, and how do we achieve these resiliency by designing the circuitries so that they can be tested uh, by incorporating more number of monitors and uh, monitoring the reliability, and also to have more reconfigurability, reconfigurability, reconfigurability options so that if something fails, you can reconfigure it and route it differently. Another thing you can uh, see is all these tiny little transistors, uh, the channel, you can see these channels are embedded into insulator. So these channels are carrying a lot of current and they are uh, embedded into insulator. So uh, heating is going to be a big issue. Um, and uh, thermal, uh, anytime you heat the device, obviously it ties back to the reliability. NBTI, PBTI, dielectric breakdown, everything accelerates if the device gets heated. So uh, making these thermal models, which is tested and verified against experimental data is very critical. Cost, so cost um, is a factor when the system you are trying to develop is su supposed to be cheap. And um, parasitics is something um, that has to be, uh, that actually increases and has to be taken into account when designing the circuits and things like that. So uh, that was um, just about uh, more more uh, CMOS options. Now more more beyond uh, uh, more more if you uh, if you remember was beyond CMOS devices. So beyond CMOS memory devices, particularly there is a lot of options. And I'm not covering the logic device options, but there are a bunch of logic device options as well. But certainly more memory device options. So uh, when you put this memory devices, you can put it into various metric. Here I have tried to just put it on performance and power and have kept kept the X's abstract. Um, but based on what other people have said, you can just lay it like this on this performance versus power X's. So obviously we know flash is very power efficient, but it is very slow. So many people are, you know, people are now figuring out ways to do embedded flash on chip. 
but flash is not the choice, ideal choice for putting it when you need um, non-volatile memory on chip. So, uh, but flash at the same time is very power efficient. And then you know that on one extreme, the choice of memory that people have is SNAP DRAM, but these are volatile memory devices, not non-volatile. The good news is that a lot of memory options that are emerging uh, for the beyond CMOS devices are non-volatile in nature. So it gives you opportunity to integrate a humongous amount of non-volatile memory, which is logic compatible on your chip, which is awesome. So in that domain, um, this is a ferroelectric field effect transistors, very much like um, um, the mainstream MOSFET, except this oxide here is reconfigurable. Uh, you can polarize uh, the oxide and uh, you know, you can get the changes in the VT. So if you're looking to design transistors with high VT, low VT, instead of doing it at the mask level, you can make it electrically programmable because this dielectric in the oxide is, uh, charges in the oxide is programmable. Um, so that is something which actually Global Foundry has already shown they can do it. All the materials that is used in this um, device is um, already developed in the semiconductor industry. So I'm pretty hopeful that they will uh, soon start um, um, giving this option. And then STT RAM is something that many foundries are offering now. So it works a little bit on a different physics than uh, other devices. Um, so you have two ferromagnetic um, electrodes and a tunneling oxide. And based on the polarization of these ferro ferromagnetic materials, ferromagnetic uh, electrodes, you can put this device either in high resistance state or in low resistance state, which is analog of a zero or one, storing or one. And then the phase change memory. So a lot of you would have heard about storage memory and things like a lot of storage class memory are made from this phase change memory material, which is another great uh, technology for getting a lot of non-volatile memory. Uh, and then this is conductive bridge RAM, which is again, not going into details of the material. You can reconfigure this device electrically and put it into two uh, states, high resistance states, low resistance states, analogous to zeros and one. And then we have this OXRAM where we work a lot. My research group works a lot on the OXRAM. And uh, OXRAM is very similar to your two terminal STT RAM, PCM and CB RAM in terms of functionality, though the device physics and details, they differ. One major advantage of OXRAM over any of these memory is that it is very CMOS compatible. The material that is used is already there in CMOS line. You can get multiple states out of these devices, which is core to AI chip, you need a memory that can store multiple uh, bits. Um, uh, so that is why we work a lot on OXRAM. And then uh, we saw that because these devices are two terminal, just two terminal, um, that, that they allow for a lot of density, high density integration is possible. But when it comes to programmability and the peripheral circuitry can become more complicated. So we, we moved on and developed a new uh, flavor of RAM where we have added a gate. So you have a gate, uh, top and bottom electrode, and you can configure the resistivity between top and bottom electrode by applying the bias on the gate. So this device, we also call it a synaptic memory device. Uh, and we have seen that this device is a lot of opportunity, offers a lot of opportunity for various types of AI chip. So, um, uh, um, so the uh, summary of the slide is that we have lots of options. Options are always great. Um, but we need to know the trade-offs. So what is the value that is being prop, um, um, added by this on CMOS device? on memory is something that um, SOC developers always want. So these on-chip memory, the only option you have is now embedded uh, on-chip non-volatile memory. Let's be uh, precise. And only option you have is embedded flash or one-time programmable EE prompts and things like that. So, but now all these emerging devices, since they are logic compatible, you can make use of them for developing various types of embedded applications where you need reconfigurability, um, a lot of in-memory computing advantages as well as logic in-memory. And I'm going to talk about this particular um, domain that we call neuromorphic or AI chips. Uh, you can also make use of these non-volatile uh, um, devices for hardware security because when it comes to hardware security, crypto, uh, crypto cryptography becomes important. Uh, and when it comes to cryptography, key becomes important. Uh, your uh, crypto algorithm is as strong as your key. 
and uh, Galois would know more about it. But then you need a secure way to store your key and these memory devices would provide solutions to for the secure key storage. And then monitoring applications and things like that. In addition, these devices that I'm showing you are very rich in device physics. So instead of putting everything into zeros and one, you can make use of these device physics to do a lot of computing in analog domain. And that is actually very beneficial when you go to develop the neuromorphic chips. So with that, if there is any question, just stop it, stop me. Uh, if not, I'm trying to go on moving. So a little bit about more than more technologies. You can say that this is traditional PCBs where every chip, every package die was connected via wires and things like that. That, that used to add a lot of um, uh, parasitics, which was not desired. So people moved on to 2.5D integration. 2.5D integration is actually very fascinating. You can um, uh, decrease all these parasitics being the chip on top of silicon interposer, which is silicon interposer is used to route the signals between two chips. And use this technology, people, particularly Intel, have to make a lot of triplet type system where you are not restricted not to use the chip from just one foundry for your processor. You can just put a lot of chiplets from various foundries uh, with various functionality on your silicon interposer, route it through the interposer, and you can get a lot of functionality. Even moving further, you have a full uh, 3D integration where instead of these chiplets being laterally laid, you can put these chiplets on top of each other. And then you can connect all these chiplets via through silicon VAs and stuff like that. And that provides you even more opportunity to do um, different type of uh, functionality in your single um, chip. So with that in mind, um, we can say that um, there is a lot of good things that are coming into the picture. The question lies in understanding how do we may we make use of it. Um, this is a little bit into 2.5D packaging, just an exaggerated schematic. You can see we have a packaging substrate, uh, active interposers, which is made out of these interposers could be either active or passive, but here they they have also moved on to making active interposers, which is basically your silicon platform with some uh, VAs that you can reconfigure to make various types of reconfigurable reconfig connections between your chiplet. So in this case, your chiplets are DRAM, GPUs, another set of DRAM. You can make very um, uh, connections using this. And then at the end of it, what you end up making is a high bandwidth memory um, for these GPUs, which is very, um, much needed for AI. So uh, with that, uh, we see what um, opportunities 3D packaging offers. So 3D packaging takes the packaging even to um, the next level where you have package and then you have uh, these bumps, uh, shorter bumps, you have logic, logic fabric, and then you have memory fabric, and then you can have a neuromorphic chip. It's, uh, and in that particular domain, I would like to highlight uh, the IBM's architecture where you can do, uh, you can put uh, approximate computing and uh, precise computing, precision computing, uh, computing with various types of precision, the same fab, and that is very, very uh, useful for doing of enabling of AI-based applications. And you can have a layer that monitors the trust and security of your chip. Uh, you can have communications using RF sensors that is monitoring um, various types of activities, whether it's your physiological activity or environmental or whatever. And then on top of that, um, best, best way to make use of these chips in particularly IoT environment would be if you also integrate energy harvesting, where instead of powering these devices all the time, if it is also harvesting energy from the environment, that would be picture perfect system. So you can put all these things together. In addition, you can also align it with the chiplet. So this would be like a perfect seen for developing a lot of opportunities. Okay, so uh, just um, to think, what do we need for this to uh, happen? For this to happen, we need advanced verification and validation tools. And this is another excerpt from IRDS. You can see clearly uh, some of the issues that are highlighted at the device level, and that has to be addressed by um, uh, having more robust uh, verification and validation tools to take complete uh, to make complete use of these technologies. So uh, existing CAT tool provides limited solutions in these domains. We need to uh, work on providing, uh, making these CAT, advancing these CAT tools. So you know we get what we want out of these things. Um, 
So now I'm switching gear a little bit. So that was about my semiconductor process technology trend, moving on to seeing how we can make use of it for AI chip and the application of AI, uh, I'm not going to go into details, but particularly for IOTs where everything is connected uh, and everything is collecting data, it does not make any sense for all the data to be sent because for AI, what we need is only the features that are important for training the network. So how about having all these AI chips that are integrated into the sensor itself, which is, which is making sensors smart and make decisions locally and um, uh, into that word should be sent to the cloud for, for evaluation. So that is the whole uh, purpose of putting AI in the edge. Um, so for that to accomplish, uh, to happen, AI needs to be ultra low power, 100 milliwatts or less, um, so that it can be operated by lithium ion battery. And even better would be if energy scavenging. Low cost, compact, high reliability, high accuracy, always on. A lot of people talk about it. Extreme environment, such as automotive, outdoor space, aviations. If you know these things, um, then uh, temperatures are high, radiations are high. The AI chip that sensor is, um, in, the AI chip that sensor is embedded into the sensor, that has to be robust. And that is because now if AI in the sensor itself is deciding what data to send to the cloud for further evaluation, then it is very important that this AI that we are putting into sensor is uh, robust because we know that um, uh, the training of AI uh, uh, is very dependent on type of data we uh, send it for the training. So uh, with that, going into how the chips are he helping, uh, you have all these, you know, uh, I'm not going to talk more about the neural network, more or less everybody now knows it but you have input coming, it is um, multiplied by the weight, you have the activation function, you integrate some bias function into it, and then you get output out of it. What I want to highlight here is the amount of multiply and um, accumulate operation that is taking place. And every time you multiply and accurate, uh, accumulate and you have an output function, you go back and compare it to the um, error. And if it is not where you want it to be, you have to go back and reset your weight. So when it comes to memory, uh, thinking about what is happening in the processor, processor is performing a lot of um, multiplication application uh, as well as stored a lot of data to the memory, fetching a lot of data from the memory. So if you uh, look at it um, as a result of it, what happens is these type of things become very memory intensive. That is why it is not possible to put most of these things uh, on a SOC or like that. Uh, over time, uh, the uh, yeah, deep neural network is evolving and it is getting more and more complicated. You can see that uh, these are networks uh, such as ResNets and all, they have more than uh, 152 layers, which means you need more computing, more um, memory, everything has to be more. So, uh, so for that, the currently available technologies are not there where they should be. So we need more to integrate more, more number of, you know, more type of devices into it. And this is the famous uh, roofline model and that is proposed by the Google. Um, particularly, you can see the most of the AI, they, they are very intensive on the memory. So most of them are limited by the performance of most of these AI algorithms are limited by memory bandwidth. And you can uh, improve it a lot if your memory bandwidth improves. And that is why people went on to get this high bandwidth memory, where you can see a true example of um, this um, uh, 3D integration schemes. So with all this thing going into the background, the question is, um, what do we, how do we solve the remaining challenges? So to solve the remaining challenges, the emerging device technologies are very useful. So this particular um, scenario, I'm trying to show you a crossbar array, which is connecting the input and output neuron to this RAM. And uh, the matrix medication that you were trying to do it here by, uh, uh, by the MAC unit is done by the fix of this RAM device. So, so it is coming here, it is getting um, multiplied by the conductance of the device naturally, and then it is getting summated on this wire, and then it is fed to this neuron, which uh, you can set the threshold of the neuron, which fires when the uh, signal is the, above the uh, threshold. So this matrix multiplication becomes very easy when you integrate crossbar array of these devices. Also, these devices are reconfigurable. So when you want to change the resistance device, you can just go back and reconfigure the state of these devices and then 
this is a set of your in-memory computer. So we have implemented this system. Students, some of these students are here. Uh, we can add more, uh, or you can ask them more questions. But uh, have, our paper in this area is published in TVLSI. It's going to be coming very soon. Uh, we have also implemented a new type of um, uh, unsupervised, unsupervised learning, uh, uh, which helps us make this network very lightweight. Um, and this type of network we believe is perfect for implementation in the edge devices because it would be very effective in extracting the important features from the data uh, that can be then sent into the cloud. A little bit about our RAM device. This is a two-terminal device. You can put, um, I will not go into device physics, but the essence of this is that by having this two-terminal device, you can get multiple resistance states. Now these, there are two domains of RAM. Uh, one we call long-term memory. So long-term memory is where states are non-volatile. You put it into state and it is going to be there unless you really program it. So that is very good for our inferencing system. Uh, another type of RAM is where we have short-term states where um, the state is retained just for a certain amount of time based on how you have programmed the device. And that is because in um, uh, AI, the weight changes quite quickly. So if weight changes quite quickly, then it doesn't make sense for you to have a device that retains the state for 10 years because you know number of st all states are not going to be retained for that many years. So we, we made a very clever use of this unique device property to design the system where we intrinsic decay in the state of these devices was used to make a very efficient uh, training platform. So with the combination of um, the short-term states in RAM for training and long-term states in RAM for storing the weight, what we did is we created the system which can be trained very efficiently, as well as once it is trained, you can transfer all weight into this RAM that has long-term memory and you can make use of the system for your inferencing. So this is training and inferencing happening in the same system. And then this is some results that my students have generated by uh, circuit level simulations as well the architectural simulations. And um, our work is going to appear in this uh, TVLSI paper. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to conclude my session on AI chips. Does anybody have any suggestions or any questions? So um, I had a quick question for you. So um, uh, I was involved in a neuromorphic chip before uh, at okay. Dell, and we looked at these devices. The problem that we ran into back then mm -hmm. was that um, the devices had a lot of variability, so you couldn't actually guarantee that two chips will actually behave necessarily in the same way. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, there were the researchers, um, nor, uh, I guess, in bioengineering that would suggest that neuromorphic chips actually benefit from randomness, so that is not a problem, but from a system mm -hmm. perspective, that's not necessarily a desirable mm -hmm. uh, effect. Uh, do you face these problems now? And if yes, how do you deal with that? So, um, so I have students, Andy, you did a lot of uh, simulation. Do you want to comment uh, on, any of these? Uh, yeah, so um, we did a lot of tests with this particular network and found that with the right algorithms, they can actually be really robust to a lot of variability in um, the intrinsic properties of RAM. So they may decay at different rates. Um, various properties are very variable, like you said, uh, but the we found that they were robust to like, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers, but it was up to like 10% variability in decay or 20 even, and it was still able to classify um, various digits of MNIST. So um, the other caveat to a lot of these AI algorithms is that they require randomness in weight initialization. And if you set the RM um, arrays to all the same value and give it a second to decay, they'll actually achieve the necessary randomness to um, begin executing whatever algorithm you're using. So there are some um, kind of 
benefits that you might not anticipate with RRAM. And like I said, with the proper algorithms, they can actually take advantage of the variability. Yeah, the, the variability and the randomness is very good for, for generally for neuromorphic and for STDP and all those things. But uh, it, it actually doesn't make verification very easy or oh, reliability. I see. I see. Yeah, that is a um, that actually is a very good point that you brought, and that is where we are seeking collaborations to work together to do this. One more thing uh, I wanted to point out uh, is that we have a combination of short-term memory for training and long-term memory for inferencing. Now we do the thresholding on the short-term memory, and then after thresholding, we uh, come up with a bunch of states uh, that we store in long-term memory. So uh, we are not storing a continuous uh, array of states into long-term memory, but just uh, quantized level of states. Now, in the long-term memory that we have seen, um, the eight states or the four states or the six states that we see, those states are pretty well behaved. So probably that could be another reason that we don't see too much of impact of variability on the uh, inferencing. Uh, but at the same time, we have done the test uh, systems with just MNIST data. Uh, probably be more uh, variability may become a big problem if the data setting changes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so yeah, I agree with you. I mean, um, uh, 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 developing a way to verify these systems and to validate would be. Uh, a very useful thing to do in this area. Okay, so those were good questions. Um, moving on. Okay, so I'm changing my gear a little bit because I wanted to cover a bunch of things we are doing. So, you know, I'm not going to go into details because of the lack of time, but you know, the security of microelectronics is becoming a big concern. And that's because majority of companies in the United States is getting fabulous and you have to outsource your layout to the offshore foundry. Once you, lay, uh, off, once you send your layout to the offshore foundry, you can have possibility of IP piracy, counterfeiting, hardware frozen insertion, and reuse or all, all types of issues. So people have been uh, trying to propose solutions for counteracting it. Uh, one of the very dominant solutions is logic locking, where you have this net list and then using an algorithm, you figure out ways to um, insert the key in this logic. And when key is inserted in this logic, then the attacker, even if it is making a copies of the circuit, will have to find the correct set of keys to make it functional. So this is where this area is. And obviously since then, a lot of people have come up with various ways of logic locking. But at the same time, every, every time you would see somebody has proposed a technique to lock, there would be following paper that somebody else figured out a way to hack the keys. And most dominant technique of hacking the key is this um, satisfied, satisfiability attacks, SAT attacks where the threat model is that attacker has um, access to the working chip from open market. So from the open market, he bought the chip and then attacker has access to this layout where he uh, or she figured out this gate level net list with the keys in there. Making use of that, the attacker can uh, create a SAT model and by running this SAT model in an iterative fashion, uh, attacker can figure out all the keys. So, um, so that is a problem. So um, this is kind of going on. And then a lot of people are proposing solutions. I, I particularly like this solution, which was um, put forward uh, in 2008, where they are making use of cryptography to lock the key. And that cryptography key is a combination of chip specific key, which is generated by the foundry. And it is very specific to the particular die itself. And that key is essentially superimposed with the common key that the designer had used to get an input key. And once that input key is given to the circuit, then the circuit operates. So this is a very cool technique. Even if an attacker figures out all the common key, there's no way they can figure out the input key unless they are able to get into this um, uh, hacking. But problem of this uh, approach is that uh, you need to have various, uh, many set of input keys there and managing the key becomes problem. And 
and that the criticism that I have heard about this type of technique. But but anyway, I have I still think that is a very good technique of encrypting the logic. Uh, particularly for Department of Defense, I don't think it would be um, possible for attacker to get access to a working chip. And if attacker does not have access to the working chip from the market, then this thing will become uh, very difficult to hack. And if you can put it, some crypto into it, then it is even more difficult. So how can RM technology help? Uh, at the very least, uh, you can make use of the RM technology to store various types of keys, which would be, and those keys are not very big size. So uh, I think RM can provide a very good way to store those type of keys. Another thing that we are um, trying to make use of RAM is RAM is a reconfigurable memory device. Unlike OTP or EEPROM, where keys are stored, which is just read-only memory, RAM is multi-time programmable memory. And nobody has, uh, to my knowledge, been uh, able to use the multi-time programmability of RAM to do something uh, or secure the chip. So what we propose is that um, you design the chip, you fabricate, assemble, key insertion, distribution, and life cycle. After life cycle, you discard the chip. Now this discarded chip, because it had key already inserted, it, this discarded chip is still functional. So the chip, which is functional, somebody can very easily reuse. So what we uh, want to do is that we want to make use of RM technology and design the devices in a way where key tends to decay over time. So key can either decay over time or you can uh, yourself design a control circuitry where you have possibility to erase all the uh, key components. So uh, we have collected some preliminary data where we designed this uh, um, system, this system, uh, and this is actually a full adder with carry in and carry out. And we have inserted eight bit key. And what we have done is that we ran a lot, we, um, started the circuit with the key, but after about uh, uh, 3.6 seconds, the state of the RAM decayed back to some unknown state. And when that happened, all the key uh, got reset to this value. So what we think is that if you have this type of key and you program it properly, then once the chip is discarded, the chip becomes um, dysfunctional and then it would be a good way to counteract the ICD use and counterfeiting and things like that. So that is something that we would like to build upon a little more and see where it goes. Another uh, thing we were uh, working on, and these are some of the ideas, is uh, basically, you know, when you send the thing for testing, testing can also be dis uh, divided between trusted uh, partners and untrusted par partners, because over the time, addition is into very expensive as well, addition, variation, everything. Now, so instead of having, if these key are basically one time programmable, then once you key in, it has to be there forever. And then the tester can reveal all the functionality of your circuit. But instead, if it is multi-time programmable memory, what you can do is you can um, have a control circuitry um, so that you can do selective testing of the chip so that one person who is testing the chip never knows the full functionality of the chip or never gets a chance to see the chip at its best. So uh, we believe that we can make use of RM technology's multi-time programmable capability to accomplish these missions. Uh, but at the same time, we have collected just the primary data in this area. We are trying to build up on this area. And our paper on this thing will be presented on this concept presented by the student Drew Hanna uh, in the uh, IEEE Midwest Circuits and Systems Conference. Um, so, um, so with that, uh, that is some of our ongoing efforts in the areas of hardware security and uh, trust. And then uh, we are also working in the areas of uh, making use of the AI chip for monitoring the, uh, getting the adaptive resiliency in the chip, particularly for the real time learning. So what we propose to do is that you have a chip and on top of this chip, you can put a lot of monitoring devices and these monitoring devices are uh, essentially adding up to your process counters um, and this is something that um, and as you know uh, we will be doing as part of the test initiative at just iucrc at the university of cincinnati but these monitoring devices are collecting a lot of data what do you do with that data you have to do something with the data so what we want to do is we want to integrate the ai chip we have developed on top of this monitoring system 
and then uh, some portions of the input is going to be routed to the AI chip and then a lot of information from this monitoring is sent to this AI chip and then we uh, develop a functional output in relation by uh, training the AI in real time, and then develop a context by uh, finding out the various monitoring parameters that we are collecting from the chip. Uh, so with that, over the time, our chip, AI chip, we are assuming that once you launch the system, it would take some time for the system to fail or some trojan to get activated. If the system runs for sufficient amount of time, then you would have collected sufficient data to create this input-output relation by training the uh, system and uh, creating a context by monitoring various aspects. And once that happens, then you can just, whenever you are getting any output, you can benchmark it against the output that was expected um, to make sure that the output and input, uh, the output from your trained model as well as your chip is matching. And in case of any attack, uh, if this is attack, some of your, uh, even if some of your monitoring parameters would differ or your output is going to be very different. So now it's your question whether to trust this chip more or to trust this more. Since this is, you can make this chip to be more trustworthy, you have already developed your model, your model based Y can, output can take over and your circuit is still to operate and at least uh, complete the mission. So this is an area that we are trying to uh, work on. We have completed some preliminary work, we, uh, which is going to be published in IEEE Access, uh, where we have made use of AI algorithm to do um, malware analysis. But now our job is to integrate these chips and um, put it together. Um, and uh, one of my students, Bailey King, is here. So this is part of some uh, tasks in his project that he's going to look into. So with that, I'm coming to the conclusions. Um, advanced process nodes. Uh, with advanced process nodes, uh, um, as it was pointed out, there are issues, uh, per particularly with the variability, but in spite of those, future of semiconductor looks very bright. But again, uh, as was pointed out, we need new CAD tools for design verification and validation, given that we have to face all these challenges. Reliability characterization becomes uh, important, and then process integration. We have trained students how to integrate various things together to make a whole system out of it. And for that, they need to know uh, devices to circuits to uh, architectures, everything. And then making use of new transistor layouts, uh, non volatile memories, and packaging, all of them together. Packaging is a big player now. So to make domain specific architecture, SOC, and things like that. Um, uh, we can get tremendous solutions out of these emerging devices for AI chips. And um, I am particularly very interested in making use of multi-time programmability of RAM to uh, make the hardware security primitives a little bit more um, secure because I don't think we are doing it uh, currently. And then um, we want to integrate the AI chip on top of the functional SOC uh, to achieve the cyber resiliency in terms of any active attack or any type of zero-day threat. So with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, various funding sources. Uh, National Science Foundation uh, uh, has been a uh, funding majority of our research, so uh, thanks to them. And then uh, Air Force Research Lab, clearly all these people at Air Force Research Lab, I'm very th thankful to them. And DAXI, many of my students have been a recipient of DAXI. So uh, Ms. Kim Allum at DAXI for funding, and then Dr. Matt Castro. At University of Cincinnati, we have collaboration with these professors, so thanks to them. And then some local companies have been supportive of our work, so very thankful to them as well. And then NIOSH um, uh, for funding our research in the areas of AI for health monitoring uh, using wearable devices. So uh, that's the slide of my presentation. Do you guys have any other questions? Well, Rashmi, thanks for um, joining us today and, and sharing the information. I know there's a few folks that weren't able to attend the talk that uh, will watch the, uh, the recorded version. But uh, thanks again for spending some time uh, with uh, with Galois today. Yes, thank you, thank you, Rashmi. So thank you so much. Um...